Welcome to our first webinar in 2016. Today's webinar, we are going to talk about understanding the heading pulse test. And the presenter will be Dr. Renato, who is uh, MD Assistant Professor. Sorry, I forgot to change the slide. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Renato is an assistant professor in, in Pará, in a, in, a, in a university in Brazil. My name is Mariana. I'm the moderator of this uh, webinar today. Uh, and I'm educational and training manager at Autometrics. A little bit of the practical about this webinar today. All, all, all of you are muted, so we are not going to hear, so we reduce the background noise, so we can't hear your questions. And that's why we have a question box. So I will ask you if you have any question to use the question box in your right side of your slide. Uh, the questions will be collected during the session. And at the end of the session, we will answer your question. If we don't manage to answer all the questions, we will reply to you by email after the webinar. If there is any technical problems, please write to me directly and I will try to resolve from here the problems that you are having. So now please, Dr. Renato, it's your turn to make us a little bit clever. Okay. Um, are you seeing my screen here? Yes. yes. Um, okay. And I'd like to thank you, the Automatics, for the, the opportunity to be here. And I would say good morning because I'm in Brazil, and right now it's 9 o'clock a.m. I know there are some people in, you know, Europe and Asia, and, you know, so I would say good afternoon or good evening to everybody. So what I'm going to talk about today is the, about the video heading pulse test. Of course, there's a, you know, there's a huge topic and you know we don't have time to go through all the details here all the artifacts and the clinical applications so what i decided to present today is an overview it's uh, some background about you know physiology and to show us some clinical applications in how the vheat can help us you know in our daily basic practice and i'm you know i'm such a guy that likes history i think that when we start you know studying history we can understand where we came from and where we go. So I'd like to take two minutes of your time here to, you know, tell a little story here about one guy. This guy is Robert Barney. Uh, I guess everybody knows him. He, he was born in Vienna. And he was graduate in the University of Vienna in 1900. And Dr. Barney, uh, when he was in the medical school, he was pretty much convinced that he would become a psychiatrist, especially because he had a great professor, a well-known Sigmund Freud, I guess everybody knows him. And, you know, in the last year of the medical school, Dr. Barney, he decides to become an ear surgeon, and he was under the influence of Dr. Politzer. And, you know, for, you know, like us, the Dr. Barney become, you know, ear surgery, and in 1906, he described what we call caloric water irrigation. And, it, you know, it's funny because this clever observation comes in a very antiquical way. He was like washing out some crown gear and he, he just realized that when he used warm water, you got, you know, vertigo and nystagmus beating to one side. And when he used cold water, you know, the patient still having vertigo but in the stagmus leading to the other side and he comes you know to description of you know calories and it was a very controversial he got some trouble with some of his colleagues for intellectual properties and but the point is he described it and he becomes a world famous for that you know as every enthusiast of the medicine dr barney becomes a volunteer for the first world war and in the first months of the war, he was kept as prisoner in Russia. And, you know, the, the, the interesting part of this story is that in 1915, when he was a prisoner, you know, Dr. Barney, he was laureate with the Nobel Prize. And that has been a negotiation between the Russian Czar and the Prince of Sweden to release him 
and he could, you know, get his Nobel Prize and he could join this very, you know, selective team here of the Nobel Prize winners. So why I'm telling you this story here? Because since 1906 until now, we still using calorics. I mean, calorics is the widely most used test for vestibular function. I mean, it, it doesn't matter if you are in South America, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, or in the United States, calorics is the most popular way. And at least in my opinion, the, there's no other test that we have been using for more than 100 years, and they're still popular. So, uh, my point is, I guess in a few years, video head and pulse test is going to, you know, take one out of this caloric importance for many, many reasons. We go through these reasons through the presentations here, but I have no questions that VHEAT is going to become, you know, very widely used. So, when we talk about, there are three big problems. In, each, in any, any visible test, you have these problems here. First of all, is there is no test that could evaluate all the sensory organs from the inner ear, which means you can use VHEAT for semicircular canals, you can use VAMP for the maculas of the utricle and the sacral, but there's no one test that could test the five sensory organs, and that's a problem. The second problem is that all of the tests, they are functional, which means you're not testing the, you know, the inner ear itself you are testing, you know, most of these process that comes from the labyrinth, which is an indirect way to test the labyrinth. There's not direct test at all. And, you know, the third and maybe the most important one is that the CBER tests, they give us no diagnosis, which means, you know, if you're, you know, expecting to send a patient to a CBER lab and, you know, expecting to find out if the patient has many errors or PPPV or neuritis, you're not going to, you know, find it out because they are just functional tests. I mean, the vestibular test can tell us if your labyrinth is, you know, it's working properly or it's not. But they, they use, I have a friend of mine, Professor Rauch from Boston, and he used to say that, to send a patient to a vestibular lab and say, look, this patient is dizzy, please do a vestibular test. It's the same thing to send a patient to a radiology department and say, look, the patient is sick, please scan. So what's the chance of the radiology to find out the disease? I mean, none. So this is three big problems about all the vestibular tests here. And when I start talking about the head impulse test, head impulse test, you know, has been described first for two professors in Sydney, Australia. Dr. Hamagi and Dr. Courtois. Dr. Hamagi is a neurologist. Dr. Courtois is a scientist. He's a PhD. And they described that in 1988 as a bedside test. It's a nice picture from my colleagues in Brazil with Dr. Courtois. This picture has been taken last year in, you know, in Dr. Magic's master class in Madrid. And, you know, the basis of the Hannibal's is the vestibular ocular reflex. We know that the vestibular ocular reflex is the ability to keep our eyes in target while we move our heads. And it's a very fast pathway. It involves like one, two, three, or one, two, three, four neurons. Very fast reflex. It happens about eight milliseconds, which is quite fast. And here is a video with Dr. Halmagi performing the head impulse test in one of my colleagues from Brazil, Dr. Duma. And, you know, head impulse test, it's a very simple bedside test where the patient is asked to look to a stationary target while the head is turned. You know, you can see that it's a turn in a very high velocity, small amplitude and high accelerations. So what we do expect in normal subjects is the ability to keep their eyes steady, you know, at target while you're moving their heads. But, you know, if you have a, you know, deficient VOR, the patient cannot be able to keep their gaze stationary and they're gonna, you can see, you know, some catch-up saccades to do the correct movements. So, here's a nice model, nice, beautiful young lady from Dr. Kingman, 
and you can see that she has the ability to keep her eyes in target while we move her hands. So she probably has normal vestibular function here. So there's another patient here, and when we turn her head to the right, oops, something happened here. You can see, look in slow motion here, you can move to the right side, and the eyes do a corrective saccade to the left. And I can conclude that the right side is damaged. So it's another patient, and we are moving his head to the left, and he has a corrective saccade. So I can tell you that the left side is not working properly. That's very nice, man. nice test, but you know, head impulse has some limitations. I mean, the clinical one. What is the main limitation? First of all, it is a subjective test, which means it depends on the ability of the examiner to identify the corrective saccades. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes, you know, uh, if you're not so familiar with the test or if the patient has some, you know, cover saccades, it's not so easy to see the, the over saccades. So it's a subjective test. Second one, it's a very hard to test the vertical canals. I mean, you can do that, but it's not so easy to test the vertical canals. And it is a quantitative test, which means I can tell that the labyrinth is not working properly because the VOR is deficient, but I have no way to measure that. So I know it's not working, but I have no way to tell how much it's not working. And it's hard to document and file, which, you know, you can use your iPhone and, you know, record the eye movements, but it's not easy. So for those reasons, you know, the Sydney group started the research to develop what we have commercial available right now. The, the ICS impulse. And when we see the ICS impulse, it's not a one or two years research. There's a lifetime research. You know, there's a picture from Dr. Ramadi, and here you can see all the different prototype video head impulse tests. You know, first prototypes, they try to use two cameras and it becomes heavy. So there's many, many, many years of research to achieve what we have commercial available right now. And this is a nice paper that comes up, you know, last year from Dr. Newman Talker from Baltimore and, you know, Sydney Group. It has been published, I guess, probably in November of 2015. And in this paper here, I put this picture because I think that's quite interesting. This is a timeline. This is a timeline since 1988 when Dr. Hamagin Kurtois described the head impulse until now. And you can see in this timeline all the different, you know, discoveries and research that have been done to video head impulse tests, which you can see that uh, there's a, you know, there's a hard job, you know, there's a lifetime job here. Um, well, to understand the VHIT, you need to understand a little bit about, about physiology. We know that, you know, uh, the head impulse is based on the idea there is a, a symmetry in the excitatory and inhibitory response. So we know that our vestibular has a neural firing activity, even at rest, which is about 100 spikes per second. And when we, you know, move our head to one side and the stereocydium bends over the kinocydium, we have an excitation, and this excitation is proportional to the head velocity. If you move your head fast, there's a huge excitation here. It comes from 100 spikes to 400. And in the other side, you do have an inhibition. But this inhibition here, it comes from 100 spikes per second to zero. It cannot go below zero. So this asymmetry is detected and is the base of the, what we call second default law. And, you know, when we start talking about VHIT, I have a lot of, you know, students and residents and they asked me about what is the VOR gain. The VOR gain is nothing more than relation between the head velocity and the eye velocity. We know that when we move our head to one side or to the other side, our eyes are supposed to be on target, which means they do exactly the same movement in the same amplitude, in the same velocity, but in the opposite direction. So the concept of the gain is the relation between eye and head velocity. And in normal subjects, it's supposed to be one. So what the VHIT does, you do, you know, head movement here, you have the head movement and you have the eye movements. And for make the display easy, 
the software inverts the eye movement, put together, and you do that a lot of times. And that's, you know, that's the image you have in the video heading pause test. You know, continue with the physiology here. Um, when we move our head to one side, I mean fast, but not as fast as an impulse, you do have, you know, an increasing in neural firing activity in the right side, so it comes from 100 to 200, and you have an inhibition in the left labyrinth that comes to 100 to 0. So the, the information that comes to the VOR, they are proportional, and you have your head and your eyes falling through very precisely. When you do an impulse here, you do have a very big excitation in the right labyrinth here. It's proportional to the head velocity. So you come from 100 spikes per second to 300 spikes per second. And in the left side, you do have an inhibition. But the inhibition, you know, go until zero. You cannot go below zero. So the information that comes to the VOR is not proportional. So that's why sometimes you do have a small difference between the head velocity and the eye velocity, even in normal subjects. When we think about a pathological situation here, uh, here's a patient who had, you know, vestibular defrontation in the right side, which means the right side is not working. And when we move our head to the right, there is no excitation in the right, but that is still having an inhibition in the left. And that's why you have a low gain, I mean the eye cannot follow the head, but you still have some response. And the response here, it comes from the left side, which is in this example here is normal, but the right side is damaged. So that's why you don't have no response at all. So when we took the same patients and move our head to the left side, which is the healthy side, you do have an inhibition, normal, normal I mean sorry, you do have an excitation here in the left side but you do not have the inhibition in the right side. And that's why you have, you know, uh, not match eye and head velocity. And this is the explanation for sometimes when you have a patient that, you know, had a vestibular nerve section in one side and you do the impulse to the healthy side, the gain is not so normal. It's because the absence of the inhibitory component here. So, uh, we have to be familiar with this case. What is this a case? A case are, you know, corrective movements. It's, you know, it's what we do to try to keep our gaze in, you know, in focus. When we move our head and the VOR is not precise, is deficient, we trigger as a case, which is, you know, catch up the eye to put in the primary position. So here's an example. You have the head velocity and you have the eye velocity. So it doesn't match at all. So it tricks a saccades, which is a very fast movement that comes, you know, it takes much more than the eight milliseconds of the VOR. I mean, we know that saccades, you know, takes for around, you know, milliseconds to be triggered, especially because the cortical involvement. So, and this is the reason, I mean, the VOR is quite fast and the saccades has a different, you know, pathway. So, in this example here, you are moving the head of this patient to left side and you see, oops, a saccades here. So, what, this is over saccades. This is a saccades that our eyes can see. But, you know, the Sydney group, Dr. Weber and Dr. You know, McGarvey, Kurtois, Hamagi, they have published, you know, in, nine, in 2008 what he called cover saccades. Cover saccades are some of catch-up saccades that are triggered while you move your head. I mean, you have the over saccades, that is saccade that happens after the head stops, but you still having some of saccades here that is triggered while you're moving your head. I know that first time we look at that sounds confusing, but it's not. And this is a video, uh, Mariana gave it to me. And this is a very interesting video. Here you can see a patient, when we move to the right, you see a corrective saccade here. So they have a right side problem here. The left side seems quite normal. This is over saccades. But when we do, you know, is here, look, you move to the right, seems normal. You look to the left and it still seems normal. 
But if we look this patient in a very slow motion, like frame by frame, you're going to understand what is covers a case. Look here. The patient is moving the head, it's moving the head, it's moving the head to the right, the head still moving, and oops, and the head still moving. So this is covers a case. And this is a case here you didn't see with the naked eye. But the video handy pause can show us that. So is that clear the difference between the cover and over saccades? I hope so. If you're not, we're gonna go through you know the questions. So first of all, we need to get familiar with the hardware. I mean, this is the commercial available heading pulse test, the ICS impulse. It's um, you know it's a very light goggle here, and this goggle is connected to your laptop or your computer with a USB cable. Uh, you have a right side camera and you have, you know, uh, infrared camera with a gyroscope and accelerometer and a crystal to reflect the pupil. And, you know, the great advantage of the ICS in FOSS is because they have been, you know, trying to compare it with the search coil, which is the gold standard for studying eye movements. So, uh, they, you know, did this comparison to make sure if it had is you know accurate and it has been published in a lot of different publications here you see there's a lot of different groups in the group and you know these are my some of my colleagues from Baltimore they have publishing and testing the video heading false you know versus the you know search coil here there has been a lot of publications and we are pretty much confident that the video heading false give us a very accurate you know information so one of the you know things that we should be careful with the video heading pause is with the eyes. I mean, uh, sometimes you know you should take in some of your time to make sure that you have a good image of the pupil. For example, this one is not a good pupil. The pupil is like you know it's not perfect here. So this one is a very good pupil here. Sorry, this one's a very good one. You see no interference at all. And sometimes the patient has, you know, little dots in the eye, which maybe can give us some problems during the impulse. And another, another sometimes it's trouble is Asian people. And they have, you know, the eye lips drop and, you know, sometimes you don't get a very nice pupil. And, but it's a very easy way to, you know, deal with that. You can tape uh, here in the eyelid and make sure that the pupil it's pretty, you know, nice. And, you know, some people have this kind of tattoo in the eye. It's, it's terrible because, you know, in this example here, you cannot do the test because, I mean, the equipment cannot detect the popular at all. So this patient he cannot do the test. I mean, another great point about the VHIT is because you can test not just the lateral canal, but you can also test the anterior and the posterior canal which is the LARC, the left anterior and right posterior, and the raw plane. So it's a test that gives us information about the VOR gain in all different six semicircular canals. And another, you know, thing that we should be do very precise is about the velocity. I mean, when we just start in doing the video heading pulse test, one of the most common, you know, errors is because people do the test in a very slow velocity. And we have to remember that when we do, when we move our head in a slow velocity, you're not testing the VOR. I mean, you are testing the upper motor system. So the recommendation is that you should perform your head impulse. I mean, faster than 120, you know, degrees per second in lateral canals. So this is the ideal range for the velocity. You know, some of the research they you know, advocate that you should perform your velocity, your impulse as, you know, as fast as you could. But I just remember that sometimes you're dealing with, you know, old people with some neck problems and I just don't feel safe to go, you know, faster than 250 degrees per second, but you can do that. And for the vertical canals, I mean, the velocity uh, could be a little slower, but not so slow. So I do recommend the ideal range is over 100 degrees per second. So this is one of the questions that when we present anything 
think about the V-Heat, a lot of people come to us and say, look, doc, I already have a caloric test in my vestibular lab. Do I need a V-Heat? And I use it to say, yes, you do. You do. I mean, the V-Heat, when we do the comparison with the calories, I mean, each of them can evaluate the labyrinth individually, and that's great. I mean, I can test the right side independent, I can test the left side independent. And this is the same thing of the calories. And maybe this is the big reason of calories is still, you know, popular, because, you know, other vestibular tests like the rotary chair, and you cannot test each side individually. So, the v -heat you can assess the circular canals, while the caloric you will assess only the lateral semicircular canals. v -heat is a very quick to perform. I mean, for something who has experience, uh, you can do the test in, you know, five minutes. I can tell you that sometimes I spend four minutes testing all different canals in a patient. So, it's a very quick test. And, you know, caloric taste, you know, less in at least 20 minutes. I mean, it's very unusual for someone to do a caloric test in less than 20 minutes. So, V-Heat is a very well tolerated by the patient, even patient in acute phase, which means sometimes you are, you know, in acute phase, you have nystagmus and you have vertigo, but you can still do in the V-Heat. And I dare someone to do the caloric in the acute phase. I mean, it's very unpleasant for the patient. You know, v -heat, you access the labyrinth in a high frequency, which is much more physiological way to access the vestibular function. And in the color test, you test in a very, very, very low frequency, which is a not physiological one. And one of the advantages is also because v -heat is a very, you know, it's highly repeatable, which means you can do that in a very repeatable way. And calorics is extremely variable. I mean, you can compare the right side and the left side of the same patient, but you have to be sure that the stimuli was the same, that the ear canal has the same, you know, form, the patient has no tympanic membrane perforations, they have no uh, middle ear disease. I mean, there's a lot of uh, vari variability in calorics. And what is most interesting about v -heat is because you can test, retest how many times you want. I mean, sometimes you are just in following up with the patient, following up a patient, on the right patient, and you can do v -heat every, you know, time you see the patient, you can do the test. It's a very well tolerated, but hardly the patient will tolerate more than one caloric test. I remember I had a patient, uh, you know, a couple years ago, and he told me that he went to a ENT doc and the ENT wants to do caloric every time he goes to the office and he's, you know, he just stopped to go to the ENT because he cannot tolerate caloric. So, and I'd like to, you know, bring your attention for some data about the DC patients. And in this paper here from Baltimore and, and Sydney group, uh, they show us that just in the United States, they had 4 million U.S. emergency department visitors for acute vertigo or dizziness per year, which is huge. 4 million visitors for dizziness, and uh, just in terms of comparison, you can remember that Denmark population is a little bit more than 5.5 million people. So, it's like Denmark goes to the United States emergency department just complaining about vertigo or dizziness per year. And what is more terrifying is that over a million of these four minutes here are overtested, misdiagnosed, and undertreated. And why is that happen? I mean, when you have you know, vertigo attack and you go for emergency department, I guess everybody does a CT scan or an MRI, and you know, you perform a lot of blood testings and cardiovascular tests and neuro tests, and sometimes the you know the emergency department dog, he is not familiar with the vestibular disease, so they got, you know, misdiagnosed, and of course they are under treatment. So it's extremely important for everybody to know and to learn how to deal with this patient here. And what's the cost of that? In the United States, they spend $9 billion a year with this patient, $9 billion. 
I mean, it's so much money. I have no idea how much money is ninety billion dollars a year. So I took a um, plot here of the you know GDP, GDP of the world, and you can see all these light orange countries here in Central America, in South America, in Africa, and Southeast Asia. They don't produce nine billion dollars in their economies per year, and you can you know have an idea how much money is spent in the United States. So. For us to finish this presentation here, I'd like to, you know, to show you some examples of how VHEAT can have clinical applications here. So let's pay attention to this clinical case here. This is a four, six years old male, male, you know, he's a mechanical engineer and, you know, he had an onset of acute vertigo just four hours ago and he has no other health issues. He's a young guy, pretty healthy no hearing loss and no chronic medications and you know he went to the emergency department he was nauseated and vomiting and his blood, blood pressure was you know quite high just because he was you know nervous and when we deal with the patients in acute phase I do recommend it for everybody to read this paper here it's a paper from Dr. Katai and Newman Tucker from Baltimore and this paper, it has been published, I guess, in the Stroke Journal in 2009. And it, you know, gives information about what we call hints. What is the hints? Hints is the head impulse, the stagnant gaze, and test of skill. And when you approach acute face patient with this, you know, three tests here, maybe you got more precisely than an MRI in the first 24 hours. And let's apply the hints in this patient here. So look at the head impulse of this patient. You, oops, you move to the right side and you see as a case. Okay? And left side seems quite normal, right? So if you do in slow motion, you can see to the right, look, it's a case. So I know that the right side is broken. So when we pay attention to stagnant gates here of this patient, um, I hope everybody seen the video, I mean perfectly, but this patient has a left beating horizontal nystagmus. And when he looks to the left side, it increases. And when he looks to the right side, it decreases. This is the Alexander law. And it tells me that it's, this is probably a peripheral problem. And the test of skew, I mean, there are no skew deviation. So you do a cover test, and you see no, you know, vertical strabismus, which is, you know, probably a peripheral disease. So let's pay attention here. The patient is with eyes open. With the video, you see a left beating nystagmus here with the eyes open. And what we can do here, you can see the nystagmus beating to the left side. When you, you know, close the eyes, the nystagmus, you know, become more intense. It's still horizontal, it's still left beating, and you open the eyes again and ask the patient to look to the right, to the left, and the nystagmus increase. When he look to the right side, the nystagmus decrease. So it probably gives us the information that the right side's not working properly, right? So when we do the video handing pause here in this patient, so there are a lot of interesting information here. First of all, the VOR gain is low in the lateral, right lateral canal, and the gain is low in the you know, right anterior canal. But in the posterior canal, the gain seems pretty normal. So I have this movement here, which is the spontaneous nystagmus that have been shown in the healthy side, and they do have the saccades, I mean over saccades and cover saccades. So I can tell you that this patient here, he has probably a vestibular neuritis. And the vestibular neuritis, you know, it's affecting just the superior part of the vestibular nerve because it damages the lateral and the anterior canal. And it spares the posterior canal, which means it spares the inferior parts of the vestibular nerve. So this is the 3D, which is a nice view. I remember Dr. Halmagi, he used it to say that we should look for the tunnel here, and you see the tunnel in a very clear way in the lateral and anterior right side canals. Here is the next plot, 
which is a nice way to you know display the results. You have the anterior canals, the lateral and the posteriors. You see the right anterior is broke and the lateral posterior and the lateral right side lateral is broken as well. So what's the conclusion of this case? It's a very typical case of acute unilateral vestibular hypofunction, I mean problem neuritis, and, and it takes just the superior branch of the vestibular nerve and it is spares the inferior part. So to make sure that we're gonna remember hints, uh, there's a mnemonic, an easy way to remember the hints to infarct. Infarct is a patient with central vestibular pathology and they use it to have normal impulse, fast phase alternates and refixation in cover tests. And this patient went to MRI and MRI was normal. Um, I can ask you, does it really necessary with the HINCE protocol to ask for MRI in this case? Um, I don't know, this is a discussion that we can you know, have another time. So I wanna show you what's happened with these same patients 18 days after the onset. So 18 days after that, he came to my office and you see, there are no spontaneous nystagmus anymore with the eyes open, right? And when you do the eyes close, you see no nystagmus anymore, which seems pretty nice to compensate. And I went to do some head shaking in attempt to, you know, test in the asymmetry. And the head shaking, it's quite normal. There are no nystagmus after the head shaking and I did a vibration nystagmus as well, trying to you know, see if the patient has any you know, asymmetry, and there are no nystagmus vibrations at all. So this patient seems pretty normal, right? And I did the V-hit again. And what we see in the V-hit, the gain is recovering, right, in the lateral canal and the anterior canal. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. You see no spontaneous nystagmus here anymore, and you know the saccades, the co the over saccades, they become much more you know cover, and you know you have a clear way of being that. And this is a nice plot, and it, the software gives us how the gain you know increases from the first visit to the second visit, and you can you know show to the patient how much he's recovering. And Look what happens with the over and cover saccades. This is in the first evaluation here. This is in the second evaluation here. So the patient's pretty much well compensates. I mean, the gains recovery and the spontaneous nystagmus disappear and the saccades become much more, you know, clean, but they still having some, some cover saccades here. So this is the information I have today. I'd like to do some acknowledges. Um, all these guys here, some of them I might, are my close friends, some of them are great research, and I do recommend that everybody to read these publications here. Dr. Barin, he has some nice you know, presentation with the automatic channel, and um, this is a very you know, multidisciplinary team. We have audiologists, we have PhDs, we have you know, otolaryngologists, you have neurologists, and you have physical therapists. And, you know, all these guys here, they have some kind of, you know, they teach me something about beta hypostasis. So, thank you very much for the audience. I hope everybody liked it. And I'm completely available for any kind of questions that you have. Thank you, Henan. It was a really nice presentation and you got some questions. We are a little bit late. But I think we should take uh, just a couple of them. The other ones I will, uh, I will answer to you in a, in a mail to the people that have sent to us. Uh, another comment is someone said that it was really difficult to see the videos and I agree with that. I will talk to Renato afterwards and see if we can make it available uh, somehow. So, just uh, one question, Renato, for you. Uh, what can I expect of the V-heat uh, if, would, how would uh, the V-heat look like, the results in a Meniere disease patient? Um, you know, this is a very tricky question here because Meniere disease, it's for definition, it's a very, it's a very variable disease, which means it depends. Sometimes if you evaluate the patient, acute phase of a vertigo attack, you can have one result of the V-heat, you can have like, you know, a normal V-heat, 
or if you evaluate this patient in a, you know, in other time and this patient, you know, evaluate and then evolution with, you know, hypofunction of the Meniere side, you can have another, you know, result. So I don't think that there is a pattern. That, that there's not a pattern for Meniere disease. I mean, I guess, you know, it depends in what, what is the time that you evaluate the patient. Good. One more, Renato. How you would, would you understand hyp hyperflexia in the V-heat? Uh, you mean uh, in the calorics? When you do calorics and you don't see responses, you see a hyperfunction, right? I think I'm. I, I think is that what the person is asking? Yes. Okay. So if the patient has a hyperfunction in caloric test it shows us that probably the labyrinth is not working properly. And what we can expect in V-heat is a low gain in that side. And, you know, you can see a low gain and probably you're going to see some saccades. I mean, cover and over saccades. And one of the, you know, one of the information that comes to the V-heat software, and I think that's very informative, is the asymmetry ratio between sides. So if the patient has one side hyperfunction, you're going to see a huge asymmetry. Okay, thank you. Are COVA and OVA saccades both indicators of peripheral vestibular hypofunction? Are there other causes of COVA saccades? Um, you know, this is, this is a nice question. You know, um, the, the origin of the COVA and OVA saccades, they you know, seems not to be the same origin, which is, you know, it's interesting because there are some research, you know, doing head impulse in darkness, and, the, you know, in darkness, the, the, the people don't have, you know, over saccades, but they still have cover saccades. So, um, my, my guess is that the cover saccades and over saccades, they're not coming from the same, you know, same place. So, maybe, it's not just in peripheral disease. You do have some very interesting, you know, central findings in the V-heat. And with this, you know, the central pathology, these patients, we have to pay attention because sometimes, for example, if you have a saccade, but you don't have a low gain, something's wrong. I mean, something's wrong. And maybe it's an artifact or maybe it's central or, Sometimes if you have a low gain, but you have no saccades at all, so something is wrong. And, you know, I, I use it to, I, I'm not going to tell you that over and over saccades is preferred disease, but I do recommend that when you perform a V-heat and you get some, you know, weird result that doesn't make sense, you know, looking for a central cause. Well, we are going to take the last question now because we are a little bit late. And don't be afraid, we will answer your questions by email. So, there's another question for you, Renato. Great speech. Do you believe that VHIT could become a reality in emergency rooms, mainly for patients with symptoms of stroke? Um, you know, I, I'm going to tell you something. I'm an enthusiast with VHIT. So I do believe that VHEAT is going to become the most widely, you know, tool to evaluate the vestibular system. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to use that in the immersion departments. I hope so. And, you know, the, the, the VHEAT, when we compare it with calorics, it's, you know, they have a lot of advantages. They have a relatively low cost. And I do believe that, you know, VHIT, I hope so, VHIT becomes available in all emergency departments. I, I think it's a great tool for, you know, so I, I know that some research use it to tell that the VHIT is going to become the EKG of the emergency department. I'm not sure if it's going to become the EKG, but I do hope that it's very, it becomes popular. Renato, I would like really to say thank you for this good presentation. You got a lot of uh, acknowledgement for your presentation in the questions. Uh, you, I'm sorry you can't see that, but I will share with you afterwards. Thank you very okay. much for all the participants to be here with us today. We are going to be here in about a month. 
uh, from now again with a new topic.